Hi guys, welcome back to Analog Snippets. In this video, we are going to talk about parasitic diodes and BJTs, which are attached to NMOS and PMOS in a typical CMOS process. Some of these parasitic devices are present inside the MOS models itself. Some have their own models that you can put in your schematic and simulate. But some, especially BJTs, do not even have their own models. And that begs a question. If parasitic devices are not even model, then surely they are not important enough. So why do we care? And that is a fair question. So let me try to answer this question first. One reason we want to know about these devices is that noise can couple through these devices. And primary mode of this kind of noise coupling is through substrate. Although these parasitic diodes and BJTs are normally in off state, they do have capacitance across their terminals. And if a nearby digital or switching circuit is injecting noise into substrate, that noise can couple to your circuit. And in order to devise a sound isolation strategy, you need to have a good understanding of these parasitic devices. Another reason to understand this circuit is, although in normal scenario these devices are usually off, there are circumstances or even circuits where these devices can turn on. For example, in switching power converters or in switching amplifier, some of these devices are turned on in normal operation. And in order to design these circuits properly, we need to have a good understanding of all these parasitic devices. And then there are phenomena such as latch up, which are caused by these parasitic devices. So I hope that I have convinced you that these devices are important enough to merit our attention. And so let's dive deeper. We will build our MOSs ground up and hence we will start with the well diodes. Starting point of any silicon chip is a silicon substrate, which in most cases is a lightly doped P silicon. So this is the cross section of our P substrate. Now let's build couple of N wells over that. P MOSs will be built inside these N wells. For most part in this video, I will draw cross section view of the chip. But when you open a layout, you will see the top view. So just to give you an idea how this may look in layout, I will draw the top view for this diagram. So you may actually see this kind of anvil rectangle in your layout. We are cutting this layout on this green line and we are looking through the sides. The area which is not anvil is turned into p well. So this blue section is p well. And although there are two types of doping, anvil and p well, they are built using only one mask. So if there is an anvil mask, then not of anvil mask or inverted anvil mask will be used to build p well these wells are moderately doped silicon area with roughly equal doping and depth of these regions are roughly few micrometer so as you can see here there are three things there is anvil there is p well and then there is p substrate and as you can see from here we don't have a direct access to p substrate this p substrate is biased through p well which are connected to ground. And as you can see from here, all the P wells are connected together, either directly or through underlying P substrate. Okay, now let's see what parasitic devices we have here. So we have diodes between N well and P sub and diode between N well and P well. So here I have drawn these little diodes. Now all the N wells are connected to a positive supply because they are the body of PMOS and P well is connected to ground. So all these little diodes are actually reverse biased. So normally these diodes don't conduct through diode operation. But since as every reverse biased diode has a junction capacitor, they do couple through capacitive coupling. These diodes are not part of MOS model. But these diodes are available as individual devices which you can instantiate in your schematic. So you need to look for two types of diode. One is between N well and substrate and other between N well and P well. Okay, are there any BJTs? Well, we may argue that this N well and this N well along with this P well will form an NPN BJT. Something like this. Here this arrow is arbitrary. It can as well be put on this side. So there indeed is this BJT like structure, but in most cases, this is not a threat. And the reason for it is that because N wells are positively biased and P wells are ground, the VBE of these transistors is negative. So this BJT will be turned off. 
Okay, one final point on this diagram. So I said that there will be either N-well or P-well throughout the chip. This is generally true, but there are a few exceptions. One such exception is native NMOS devices. These are zero VT or zero threshold devices, and these are built directly on the P-sub and not on P-well. Another exception is so-called BF moat layer. Wherever we have this BF moat layer, the surface is doped neither N-well nor P-well. But these examples are exceptions. You can have the whole chip which have neither the native NMOS nor the BF moat. Okay, let's march ahead and build our MOSs. We'll start with PMOS because it's simpler as compared to NMOS. So we start with NWELL and we need to connect this NWELL to a supply. So we make a highly doped N plus region which is used to make the ohmic contact and we connect it to the supply. Next we place source and drain. So we've got two P plus region. One is our source and one is drain. And then we'll have gate. In top view, it will look something like this. So you've got NWELL, the PMOS structure and the body connection. Okay, now let's look at parasitic devices. So we've got NWELL to PWELL diode and NWELL to substrate diode. Additionally, we've got two new diodes here and here which are drain to body and source to body diodes. As bulk or body of the PMOS is connected to the highest supply of any other terminal, these two diodes are usually reverse bias diode. So in normal PMOS operation, they do add their capacitor, but they do not carry any current. Normally these diodes are modeled in PMOS spice model. So even if these diodes do get forward bias, you'll know in your simulations. Okay, are there any BJTs? In fact, there are several possible combinations to form BJTs. If we traverse from PP of source to PP of drain through NWELL bulk, this is a possible PNP structure. In fact, there are a couple of more BJTs. If we traverse from PP of source to NWELL bulk to P substrate or P well, that is one PNP BJT and other is on the drain side. So we have got two types of structure here. Q3 and Q2 are one type of structure which are similar and Q1 is other type of structure. All three BJTs share the same base, which is the NWELL. Q1 is known as lateral PNP. As drain and source are usually symmetrical structure, whichever of the two have higher voltage is designated as emitter of this BJT. And later on, we'll see an example where drain acts as emitter. Q2 and Q3 are known as vertical PNP. In fact, PNP BJT used in CMOS band gaps use exact same structure. In order to turn on these PNPs, we need a positive voltage between emitter and base. That means drain, source or both need to be higher than bulk. Fortunately, in most of the circuits, PMOS is not biased that way. We make sure that bulk is always the highest voltage. So normally these PNPs are off and have no effect in your circuit operation. But now let's consider a scenario where some of these BJTs can turn on. Let's tie source and bulk of the PMOS, which is the usual connection anyway. And let's also tie gate to the source, which means PMOS is off. So this is how it will look in the schematic. In normal circumstances, this drain will always remain below VDD. But now let's increase the drain above VDD. Let's say drain is significantly higher than VDD. Let's say one volt higher than VDD. What will your schematic simulation show? In a schematic simulation, you will see a current flowing from drain to VDD. And this current will flow from drain to bulk diode. In fact, this is how PMOS is shown in some of the schematics. In reality, the situation is more complex. We don't have a diode, but a PNP BJT here. In fact, there are a couple of them. So here is our lateral BJT. Notice that because of this particular connection, the collector and base of this BJT are shorted together. So this BJT is in so-called diode connected configuration. In terms of terminal current flow, replacing a diode with a lateral BJT doesn't change things much. Current still flows from the drain to the VDD. Now let's add vertical PNP. You can see that Q3 has same emitter and base connection as Q1, but collector connection is different. 
what is the effect of adding Q3 on terminal current? In fact, Q3 causes some of the current to flow towards substrate which is grounded. That means if the main current path is drained to VDD, then there is some loss. Can we estimate how much current we are losing to substrate? We can make some rough estimates. Of course, it depends on the beta of Q3 as well. If you look carefully, Q1 and Q3 in fact makes a current mirror-like structure. Their emitter and base are shorted and Q1 has so-called diode connected configuration. So I have drawn an equivalent circuit here. Although it is not a perfect current mirror because Q1 and Q3 are different types of PNP transistor. One is lateral and one is vertical. But for simplicity, let's assume them to be the same type of transistor. So ignoring early effect, drain current will split 50-50 between Q1 and Q3. Now we are not losing any current through Q1 because all current flows into supply VDD. In case of Q3, base current does flow into the VDD but collector current flows into the substrate. Now let's consider two cases of beta. If Q3 has low beta, say 1, then the current split between base and collector is again 50-50. That means half of the half current goes into the substrate, which is one fourth current. So in this case, we'll lose around 25% of the current into substrate. Now if beta is high, say 10 or more, then most of the current will go into the collector. In the limit of very high beta, almost all current will flow into collector. So we'll lose almost 50% of the drain current into the substrate. So we can lose around 20% or 50% of current depending on the Q3 beta to the substrate. Now in general these BJTs are not modeled and that means we will not model a significant part of current going into substrate. Now in a typical circuit it doesn't matter because drain is never higher than supply. But in circuits like DC-DC converter or class T amplifier this happens very frequently. So people designing these kind of circuits do model these transistors. Before we move to NMOS, notice that adding this PNP transistor we are making our 4 terminal PMOS to a 5 terminal PMOS. Substrate is our 5th terminal. And MOS can be built directly on the common P well. So we can see our source, drain and bulk connections. So again we will have source to bulk and drain to bulk diodes. As NMOS bulk is usually connected to the lowest potential, these diodes are reverse biased. And these diodes are modeled with the NMOS model. So if you accidentally turn them on, you will know in your simulations. In terms of BJTs, we'll again have the lateral BJT forming between drain, bulk and source. This is an NPN BJT and this emitter terminal is arbitrary. In order to turn on this BJT, we need to have a positive voltage between emitter and the base. But since base is always ground and the lowest potential, this NPN is usually not turned on. So going by this description, NMOS seems to be simpler device as compared to PMOS as it contains just one BJT. But there is a twist. NMOS can also be built in so-called isolated P-well. As the name suggests, isolated P-well is a piece of P-well which is isolated from the common P-substrate. And it is built using deep N-well and N-wells. Deep N-well is a buried N-well layer which is formed beneath the surface somewhere over here. This buried layer is formed using high energy ion implantation. In your layout view, deep NWell is a rectangle and all the NMOS is built inside this. This deep NWell isolates this chunk of P-well from the bottom side. Then we use normal NWell to complete the isolations. So here we have got piece of P-well which is isolated from the other P-wells. And in the process we have created two new terminals. So we have got a deep NWell terminal which is usually connected to the highest supply available or at least higher than the source and drain of this NMOS and then we have got substrate connection which is grounded. We now have freedom to connect the bulk of this isolated NMOS to any other potential. We can still connect this to ground or we connect it to the source or we connect it to any other potential which is lower than both source and drain of this NMOS. So now in this structure we have many more parasitic devices. We have usual well diodes. Then we have got vertical NPN BJTs forming between source, isolated P-well and deep N-well and similarly on the drain side. 
and then we also have a potential parasitic PNP forming between isolated P-well, deep N-well and the substrate. And none of these BJTs are modeled in your usual NMOS model. Normally it doesn't matter because none of these parasitic diodes or BJTs are turned on. But as we have seen in case of PMOS, in some circuits, for example power converters or power amplifier, some of these devices can be turned on. For example, in this circuit, if drain goes significantly below the bulk of this NMOS, then this vertical NPN and this lateral NPN can turn on. And this can draw a significant current from the deep N-well connection. Similarly, if we are not careful enough and bias the bulk of this NMOS higher than the deep N-well connection, then it can turn on this PNP structure. I will leave out detailed operation of these conditions for you to try out. And that is all I had to say in this video. I hope you found this video useful. So please share your comments below and thanks for watching.